All right. Are there still people signing on? It looks like. Yeah. Let's let's give it another minute or two, just in case there's some latecomers who don't want to miss a minute of the excitement. <laughs> Morning, Janelle. Morning. How many are we up to now, Janelle? Oh, last count, I had one. Eighteen. Eh, that's probably as close as we'll get. Why don't we uh, call the meeting to order? I think it's about 10.03. We have a quorum. Um, is there anybody from the public who wishes to speak? All right, there being nobody, I guess, Rob, you're up next. Good morning, everybody. Hope everybody had a uh, a great summer. Uh, welcome back to the uh, the Cog Meeting Circuit. Um, I just want to take this opportunity just to uh, kind of update all the members uh, of the goings on here at the Cog uh, with respect to staff staffing. As many of you know, uh, Darlene is retiring at the end of the calendar year. Uh, so with that retirement goes another substantial amount of institutional knowledge, uh, along with Rick. So. Uh, we're, uh, we're obviously going to be uh, <clears throat> uh, moving and shaking here in order to, to make everything work. Um, the, uh, the objective here, I've met with the executive committee, the objective here is to try and see if we can recruit for that position, um, hopefully in October, uh, with the intention of having uh, preferably at least uh, four to six weeks of overlap with Darlene on her way out so that the new, uh, the new hire can can uh, adequately get trained uh, in, in the, the work that she does. Um, there was also some talk about potentially uh, adding a, a bookkeeper on a part-time basis uh, to separate out some of the financial um, tasks, uh, which obviously would also help with uh, keeping our, uh, you know, our audit uh, clean and uh, in that arrangement. Also, <clears throat> uh, Janelle uh, is going to, uh, be likely uh, be uh, performing some of the fee for service, the town planning and zoning enforcement type work that's on an individual uh, basis with towns. Uh, going to be doing that outside of COG hours. That'll be a direct relationship um, with Janelle and those towns. That'll free up some hours. I also should mention that Darlene's uh, hours are 30 hours a week for, for some time now. Uh, the intention is to kind of raise that position back up to 35 hours. So we're trying to find some hours with staffing here as much as we possibly can to try to meet some of the demands that are that are placed on the cog. Um, also, um, unrelated, but uh, I just wanted to take this opportunity just to uh, just to uh, let everybody know that I've been kind of on a one-on-one -on -one, uh, meeting arrangement with with uh, chief elected officials throughout the region, um, trying to. I met with actually half of almost half of the uh, CEOs. Uh, in the region, and I'm looking to try and schedule more of those meetings again after the uh, the August uh, slowdown because of vacation time and things of that nature. So, uh, if anybody has interest over the next few weeks in uh, scheduling the basically a one hour meeting, so I can kind of get to see uh, the lay of the land in your in your town, uh, and also just talk about some some things that are important to your town uh, challenges, uh, things that you uh, you know you appreciate with the cog or the, the cog could do differently or or, or uh, uh, expand on for you. Uh, just email me uh, if you have some some free time, 
and I'll try and see if I can arrange that. I'm trying to trying to hit more than one town and to be efficient if I can, if they're if they're next door neighbors. So uh, with that said, that's that's essentially the update. I don't know if uh, if chairman, uh, if you have any uh, additional. Oh, you're being very formal. <laughs> now, I'll just mention I'd ask Rob to do this on a monthly basis now. He's new to the job. He's we all know how Rick operated, what Rick was doing, but we feel I figured it'd be good for Rob just to have this five minute slot to let people know what he was doing and how things were going and et cetera, et cetera. So he'll be on the agenda on a regular basis going forward. So why don't we go on to the next item, which is uh, <clears throat> the community health uh, coach program. I believe Manny Barreto from the McCall Center is on. Yes, hello everybody, good morning. Um, first, I want to thank you all for having me back uh, uh, for the ability to present the coach program here. Um, as many of you know, as all of you know, um, COVID-19 has changed a lot of things in, in all of our lives over this last year, year and a half. Um, coach was uh, uh, specifically designed to uh, provide case management and support to those who have been impacted by COVID-19. Um, we started in June of, of 2020. Um, this was uh, intended to be a quick outreach and referral type of program that was funded by FEMA. We were out in the communities um, doing outreach to, to individuals, providing them with um, education and information on COVID-19, access to resources, scheduling for testing, vaccinations, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, the state of Connecticut, the older adult population was hit specifically hard, especially with all our recovery care homes, the residential care homes that are in our um, communities throughout the state. Um, so when that one year grant ended, um, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, as well as the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, um, took over that grant and started continue to provide funding for the next two years um, to the state of Connecticut. Uh, throughout the state, we have uh, five different agencies in each of the five de uh, Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services regions um, who, are, who have coach providers that are working with the, the older adult population. Um, so we are uh, going out, uh, trying to connect with individuals to provide them uh, continued more long-term case management, um, to provide um, recovery support services, mental health support services, um, connection to uh, treatment services, public uh, access to public programs, whether that be rental assistance, helping individuals with uh, disability benefits, uh, housing options, things like that. Um, we're just going out there and really trying to assist the community in, in that transition and coping with the, the current circumstances, especially as we know they're ever changing. Um, for myself, I'm the supervisor for the, the coach program through McCall Center. So we cover Demas Region 5. Um, that is covering the most northwest corner down to, uh, I would say, Danbury, Waterbury, um, Naugatuck, and essentially that western part all throughout those communities. Um, we are currently working, I'm, I'm proud to say, over the last um, two months since we've really gotten started, we are currently working with over 23 individuals providing case management. Um, and uh, connection to services. Um, and we're gonna continue to do outreach and hopefully reach a lot more than that as the time goes on. Um, I am gonna put to the host in the chat, the website um, is uh, ctstronger.org um, forward slash coach. Uh, if you click, uh, if you find yourself going to that website, regardless of where you live, you will be able to find an overview of the resources that we provide. Um, and as well as all the providers for the different areas through the different agencies. Um, so we are the older adult population case managers. Uh, we are covering individuals 55 and older. We're hopefully targeting mostly individuals in those, like I said, residential care homes, but could the coach program as a whole has um, religious case management services. They have a homeless outreach team as well. Uh, just a variety uh, of different providers throughout the state for different populations of people. Um, so I definitely, again, want to thank you. I know um, we still have a few minutes left. Uh, if there were any questions, I'd be, be happy to answer them. Yeah. One question is, do you have data on people in individual towns, not the names per se, but the numbers of people in each of the towns that you might have provided services to, just to get a sense of, you know, 
the breadth of your activities? Yeah, so I would I would definitely have to collect for for solid numbers. Um, but throughout that entire first year, uh, it was purely data that was being collected as for uh, demographic data that was being collected and submitted to FEMA uh, with with the individuals that we were outreaching to. I would say within um, region five, we probably worked with upwards of 2000 individuals um, for, for all different ages and, and um, uh, populations that we were working with. Uh, transitioning into the, the more severe case management, uh, then with the more intensive case management, we will be working with a more focused population. Uh, this is intended to address the mental health and, and substance abuse um, symptom severity that's been exacerbated by isolation or by the stressors of COVID-19 and, and work on those barriers. Um, but we do, uh, we will be maintaining a caseload per provider of at least 25 consistently throughout those two years, targeting at least 100 to 120 people. And this is, um, this is three to six month case management per person. Um, so we definitely do uh, connect with a lot more individuals than that. Obviously, through providing case management, we wouldn't be able to give out, like you said, their personal information. Um, but as the time goes on, that information will be available through uh, the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. Yeah, thank you. Any any other questions from any of the other COG members? The last thing I will add: um, these are grant funded programs, um, so the 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 program is completely a. It's completely anonymous. Everything that we do with our our clients is kept completely confidential. Um, B, the, these are grant funded programs. So the individuals that are being referred to us, um, it, it is at no cost to them. We are not charging their insurance. There's no out of pocket cost. Um, there is also a, a, an intent for this to be as easily accessible as possible. So if you find our contact information on there, and I know um, Robert Ryer is another provider that's on the line as well. I wanted him to be, be able to put a face to the name. Um, and then we have a third provider, Jose um, De La Rosa, that is working with us through McCall, who is bilingual, English and Spanish. Um, so we, we are meant to be as easily accessible as possible. If you have our phone number off of that CT Stronger website, that phone number can simply be passed along to any individual you think might benefit from this program. If you're unsure whether or not they fit the, the focus of, of our um, of what we're providing, we are still able to work with those individuals and get them connected to the per correct people. Um, so I definitely wanted to throw that out there. That's a, that's a huge uh, incentive for everybody to know that we're here and we're available um, and, and getting in touch with us should be as easy as possible. All right, are there any questions? Uh, I guess if there's none, we're gonna talk about regional transportation planning. Rob, I think it's your nickel. Rob, you're muted. I knew that I was going to do that to myself. <laughs> uh, just a quick background on the uh, the lots of program. Only six of the uh, NHCOG towns are, are eligible for that program. Uh, the RCP program, all towns are eligible. Um, and you see in your packet, uh, which may be a little confusing to follow because of the, the forms that uh, come from the state, uh, there are actually three actions that, that don't require action by the COG, uh, but just a, just a quick uh, information on that. Uh, Norfolk replacement of retaining walls, Kent uh, pedestrian improvements at various locations, and Warren uh, repair of embankment uh, on Warmock Brook. Uh, those were all uh, essentially moved uh, for staffing per, uh, reasons at the state. So no actions necessary there, but the, the one item that is uh, subject to uh, action by the COG is the amendment for uh, Litchfield uh, bridge replacement over the Still Brook. Um, essentially it's coded as a new project, but it's really uh, uh, moved forward from the 2018 step because it never made it in apparently. So uh, that's the only uh, COG action that's necessary. Outside of that, I, I provided a report uh, of, of the current projects and and the lot SIP and the RCP program that you, is in your packet. Any questions or comments? And I assume you need a vote on this, Rob? On the amendment, yes, please. All right. Uh, can we have a 
Motion, please. Who is that? Second moved. Thank you, Henry. Henry. Uh, second. Ted second. Ted. I think Ted was there first. Mm -hmm. Is there any discussion? Are we doing a... I have a many polls prepared for this meeting. Okay, good. Great. Right. Um, there we go. Can I ask a question? Sure, Barbara. How do I get one of my, my bridges lined up in there? It just got rated poor. It looks like I'm maybe looking at a total bridge replacement. Okay. Are you back the questions to me? Yes. I, I'd have to uh, I'd have to look into that a little bit uh, more and get back to you on that. Okay. Barbara, is it a town road or state road? Town. Oh, it has to be state? Well, for this, but I think for local bridges, there is the local bridge program. Yeah. No, I, I, I was thinking, well, how, how did I miss this? But uh, no, I'm already working on that. Okay. I just thought. Barbara, I'll, I'll reach out to you on email. We, we, can, we can discuss. Okay. It. All right. Thanks. All right. Um, next item. Is this still you, Rob? The grant application for um, land preservation and the like for Sharon Salisbury and Winchester? Uh, yeah, uh, we've received three requests for COG endorsement of those uh, projects. I don't know if uh, anybody from those towns has anything to, to add to that. Otherwise, it seems to be a pretty straightforward um, action. All three of these are open space grants? Uh, correct. Do any of the selectmen for those towns want to just give the uh, elevator speech, the 30 second speech on what these are all about? Salisbury, we have strong support for this. It adjoins a 50 acre uh, Boy Scout, Girl Scout camp. Um, it's a reasonable price and a very willing seller. And uh, it'd be really nice to double the size of that place. How about Sharon? Is Brent on? Yes. Brent, are you there? I see he's muted with no camera, but all right. Uh, Josh, you're on. You want to just mention the Winstead one? I am on, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to talk about it. I am trying to pull up uh, the attachment right now just so that I can make best reference of it. Um, but my understanding is that it is a 60 acre plot. This is a request from the Winchester Land Trust and it's been fully reviewed by the Board of Selectmen here in Winchester. Um, and they have also given their endorsement uh, for this application. Uh, it's almost 60 acres, I should say, with frontage on both Old Waterbury Turnpike and Rugbrook Road. Um, it does immediately abut other land trust space and it abuts um, the Winchester Water and Sewer Commission's land. Uh, so I feel that it will really help uh, not just preserve land for the sake of it, but it has an opportunity to possibly tie into recreational opportunities and uh, help protect the biodiversity and wildlife in the area. Um, so thank you. All right, um, is the intention we have one motion for all three of these? I, I did parse them out as separate polls, but- um, all right, well, Let's just do that, it goes quick, we can do that. Sure, sure. Did, did oh, moved. Moved. Second. All right. So that that was for the um, Salisbury one, right? Sure. Here, let me um, just get this out of the way and launch that. Um, that was the stip amendment just came up. Yeah, I don't know why. Mm -hmm. 
technical difficulties over here. <laughs> <laughs> Jocelyn, can you um, manage the polling from your slide? Should be in there. Um, I'm trying it. It doesn't seem to be pulling up the rest of it. Right, what, what do we do? Everybody should have the raise hand thing. Oh, there we go. Mm -mm. That was step again. Yeah. Yeah, it, it really wants to share the SIP one. <laughs> Why don't we take all three, uh, Don, and, uh, and, do the ra and we can do the raise hand thing. Right. Yeah, I think everybody has that icon on their screen. So yeah. When we so I would move all three of them. Was that, you made the original amendment, so you're changing? I'm amending in my- You're amending. Oh, oh, okay. There we go, yeah. thank you. All right. So. The the motion is for all three of these. Who is the second on it? Um, the first time around, I did have Jim Britton on there. Okay, Jim, you're okay with the amended motion? I'll second. Okay. Okay. All right. So we got all three now. Thanks for bearing with the difficulty, but here we go. All right. Okay, we got some Okay, so the motion passes. Um, and I want to point out that we're five minutes ahead of schedule, which is unusual. <laughs> In any case, uh, John Field, you're up next. Uh, Demis report. Good morning, Don. Good morning, everyone. Just real quick, uh, <clears throat> from a COVID perspective, uh, we continue to work with FEMA and long term recovery. FEMA has a designated person as part of our um, long-term recovery steering committee and uh, is starting to uh, focus us in the right direction for addressing some of our unmet needs, uh, especially when it comes to long-term economic needs. Uh, so we'll continue to work with them. They had a meeting yesterday. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to make that meeting, but um, I will get a rundown when I get back next week. Um, current status, obviously, everybody's aware that our numbers on COVID positivity have continued to rise due to different variants. There's a Delta and then there's, a, I think, another one, a Uma or something. Uh, but there's different variants, uh, variants out there. So we are um, continuing to uh, mo monitor status of that. And uh, we will... Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me one second, sorry about that. Um, so we'll continue to monitor that. The governor has been pretty adamant uh, of trying to let the local municipalities, local school systems and such make uh, their own decisions in regards to uh, their status and stuff as far as mask wearing and uh, such uh, taking other measures. Uh, the thing is with his uh, executive orders um, and his power um, basically to issue those executive orders and enforce those executive orders that expires the end of this month. Uh, they, he has been meeting with legislators to try to get an extension on that. I'm not sure how that will fare. Um, so we'll, we'll have more information uh, as it comes available to us. But uh, again, we continue to uh, monitor the executive orders and such, and you guys get the information as soon as I get it. So um, the other thing is uh, we continue to work with our uh, public assistance group and collecting data. So uh, reimbursement uh, for COVID expenses. So we'll continue to work on that. And then under normal operations, um, as you, you all are aware, we've had a couple of storms come through our way and uh, significant rains and other things. So um, we've been doing some uh, preliminary damage assessments or initial damage assessments. Uh, on Ray was one, I'm not aware of too many issues here in the Northwest corner in regards to the effects of on Ray. Um, but uh, then we just had Ida last week. I'm sure there'll be some initial damage assessments coming forward. I think there was some information that may have gone out this week, but uh, again, I'm sure I'll have more to share with you next week on that. And these preliminary damage assessments obviously are just to see if we've met the thresholds that FEMA has established 
Uh, for both of those storms, the governor did um, declare a state of emergency. Um, and uh, so we'll, more information to follow. Been working with some towns in regards to hazard mitigation. Um, our grant program obviously uh, is um, your interest in applying for a hazard mitigation grant is open until January 1st, I believe it is, or December 31st. Uh, so if you're interested in uh, doing that and you have an updated plan, um, I know a few towns have called me and asked me questions in regards to that and projects. So uh, I've been directing them to just put, uh, you know, apply that uh, you're interested in applying for that grant at some point, probably early next year. Uh, Demis staff uh, status, we, um, as uh, many of you are probably aware, we have uh, quite a shortage. Our director, um, our rep uh, supervisor, manager, uh, there's a few other positions. Well, uh, I know last week, I think they uh, closed on, they offered uh, some of those positions, or uh, I should put out, uh, um, put out the advertising for the positions. I think they're working through the process now. So um, hopefully we'll fill some of those positions, which includes the uh, state emergency management director's uh, position, which was Bill Hackett's uh, position. So uh, we'll, we'll continue to monitor that. And then this week, I have each of uh, your municipalities. I've been working with your EMDs to collect the old ITAC I call radios, and they are uh, bringing them to three designated locations. So next week, uh, Henry and I could start to pick them up. But I think of overall, that's uh, the the big things that we're working on right at the moment. Uh, it's been kind of busy with the storms and stuff, but uh, for the most part, that's it. Unless there's uh, any questions, then. Are there are there any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Boy, it's a quiet crowd today. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks, John. Okay, Curtis, household has this waste collection. Uh, thanks to Robert and Darlene for working on this so diligently and whoever else has uh, behind the scenes that I don't know about. Um, but uh, it's on Columbus Day weekend on Saturday, the 9th, uh, at the Torrington Middle, Middle School. Uh, we're really looking for some volunteers um, to help with that. It goes from 9 to 2. And one change this year is that um, uh, the contractors asking that we stagger the uh, entrance a little bit. So in each town, if you could assign a 15 or half an hour slot, sort of depending on how many people solicit you. Um, but somewhere between 9 a.m. and 1.45, because we close at 2. Um, so if somebody comes in, just ask, would you like 10 or 11 or 10.30 or 10.45? And maybe you can put them somewhere where they'd like to be. But they, it would help the vendors to have people a little more staggered. And that's about all I have. So it's, it's set to go and just people sign up. I know our transfer station was advertising they would have tickets available shortly. So yeah, we've, we've got it on our website and we haven't had any, any takers yet. I will um, say this is a, a continuing cost. You know, it keeps increasing a little bit, the disposal of this stuff. So I, I don't know what the long-term solution is, but um maybe it's more of the sort of paint category where the companies are paying for the disposal but that's not where we are right now curtis um if we have volunteers who should we contact um darlene do you know the answer to that question or robert I, I could jump in if, if you can just contact me an email works great uh, or and, and Darlene copy Darlene as well we're both trying to tag team on this uh, getting some of the nuts and bolts together for this Curtis I don't know if we need should we be meeting as a recycle uh, RAC committee before this or I don't think we need to before it because we kind of met about both both days earlier okay so yeah. we probably should in the later fall yeah, I'm working on the uh, volunteer uh, uh, instructional letter and uh, also fire police assistance and a portable rest restroom. So uh, we're, we're, we're making headway on this. See, that's what I meant. Thank you for all the behind the scenes stuff. 
I had a question on it, just to clarify. Uh, it looks like you're taking smoke detectors this time. That was on the list. That's great news. I mean, because they're, they're very hard to get rid of and it's nice to see that. Anybody else? I'm keeping you on schedule, Don. The way we're now almost 15 minutes ahead of schedule. That's good. That's okay. That's unusual, but it is good. I agree with you, Curtis. Um, Mayor Carbone, uh, the regional animal facility. Do everything I can to even get you further ahead on your agenda. Um, yeah, we're still in the waiting game. Uh, uh, Johanna Hayes um, had planned a visit out to the facility um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, unfortunately, I think there was a um, medical um, reason that she had to um, cancel somebody in her office, I think had tested positive for COVID. So um, we're trying to reschedule her to come out um, and we're waiting for the passage of the um, budget so that we'll have final determination on our funding through that grant. And that's it. That was it. Any questions for Eleanor? Well, this is too easy today. Um, sure, are we here now? Um, applications for funding under the 5310 program from CONDOT, uh, attachment E. <clears throat> Thank you again. Um, yeah, no, I, I, uh, I scheduled conservatively to, to make this look like it was moving very fast. Um, the 5310 program, I can, uh, one uh, particular update that uh, is not in your packet. Uh, I can uh, I can announce that the 2020 Section 5310 award list, which is using fiscal uh, year 2019 funding, that was uh, essentially last year's um, approval package. That was all uh, funded. That included uh, that included Sullivan Senior Center, uh, the Lark, the Winstead Senior Center, Gear, and a couple of NH Cog uh, applications as well. So before you uh, today um, is a uh, endorsement letter for uh, Winstead Senior Center, Kennedy Cent Center. Those are new new vehicles and replacement vehicles. And then also Kennedy Center Operating Assistance to Expand Program Services. Uh, Winchester uh, Operating Assistance to Expand Program Services as well. Uh, those were all ranked by COG staff and uh, they're all, uh, they were all ranked highly. And so my recommendation is to for the COG to support these uh, applications for this current cycle. And I assume that the Winstead Selectman and Josh and Eleanor are all in favor of this. I see Eleanor shaking her head. Yes, yet. we are. All right. Is there a motion to approve? No moved. Henry, second. Charlie, do we have a ballot? We'll try that again. Let's see. Okay. See how well it works. <laughs> um, here's the last one. We're getting closer in the order. Oh, here, here we go. Here we go. Okay, uh, Jocelyn, we have the SEDS update and the consultant selection for broadband. Sorry, uh, Kim Maxwell is going to join me for a quick update and he was on the wrong meeting link. So <laughs> just letting him know. Um, but uh, yeah, I do want to give you a quick update on our SEDS strategies and, and um, what we've been able to accomplish. Um, I will say, I think you all got the invitation to uh, the Economic Development Summit that we're having. Maybe, uh, maybe you got the invitation twice. Um, we hope that you can all come. It's on Thursday, September 23rd. Um, it's gonna be fun. There's gonna be food trucks, uh, beer tasting, um, and um, the city of Torrington is hosting the event. 
which we're excited about at the new Five Points Art Center. Um, and it will include some tours of the art center. So it'll be fun. Um, you'll have a chance to, again, just hear some more about what we've been able to achieve over the last year in terms of implementing our region's economic development strategy. So I think I won't spend much time on any of the other initiatives. I just wanted to um, give Kim a chance to give you an update on what we've been doing in terms of fiber to the home broadband um, part of our said strategy. Uh, and I'm gonna let him do that in one second. The other thing I wanna quickly mention to you because it was on the agenda, uh, we are working with the Northwest Connecticut Economic Development Corporation um, on uh, putting together some proposals for the Build Back Better Regional Challenge Program. I was hoping we'd be able to have a little more information for you today about that. Um, but again, everyone's just sort of running in place trying to <laughs> um, get proposals together. So it looks like right now, uh, we are going to be potentially submitting two proposals, um, one on a manufacturing cluster and one on an ag tech cluster. Uh, we're gonna be submitting those to the Connecticut um, DECD on Friday. Uh, hopefully they'll support both of them and then we'll move forward with an October deadline for um, this phase one application of that EDA program. So we'll, we'll get you some more information on that, but. That's kind of where we are at the moment. The, the comment I would make on that is that we had a meeting yesterday and Rista Malanka, who's Eleanor's economic development director and Tim Maxwell have volunteered to sort of ramrod those two proposals. And the key issue is what's the state gonna support because there are competitive proposals in these areas within the state and we're trying to see if we can get some I'll call it preferential treatment or at least an endorsement by the state for our proposals to get some attention out here versus a capital region which has their own ideas on where the money ought to go. So it's a it's a challenging endeavor and it's always been hard to get attention out here versus along the Route 91 corridor. So hopefully yeah. we'll, we'll succeed with that. And Jocelyn and Kim and Eleanor and Rista are working hard at it. The mayor did, I was just gonna say, the mayor did talk with DECD yesterday and they did invite us to submit um, as many proposals as we want from our region. So we'll submit both and kind of see where we can go from there. So oh, that's great. Thanks, Eleanor. Sure. Is, I saw Kim is on, is he ready to? Uh... Yeah, so I'm gonna share some slides here. Uh, all right, go ahead, Kim. Are you muted, Kim? <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. OK. Um, those of you who know me know that I never do anything in two pages, but I did it last <laughs> night. I sent off to Jocelyn the proposal for DECD last night in two pages. And um, so I don't think she's read it yet, but I did it. All right. But you're giving us a broadband update, right? Yes, I am. <laughs> so um, last spring, we commissioned a Torrington engineering study. It was done with CARES Act money that was completed in April. And then we then had the study um, uh, costed. And that was incredibly valuable, at least for what we're doing in addition to Torrington, because it gave us a picture of what the cost would be for a town the size of Torrington and we can use the information we have at pretty much the same level of granularity for Norfolk to create two points on the line that lets us then evaluate the cost for every other town um, based upon the road miles and housing densities of that town. Um, this also gives, if Thorington ever decides to do a network on its own, unlikely given that Optimum will probably do it for them, uh, they would have all that work already done and I think it's gave us a chance to, if we can ever get a chance to talk to Optimum, they stopped talking to me, so I don't know what that means. Um, but we we're trying to figure out a way of getting Optimum to build a better network than the one they're proposing. And having all this information, is, which we've given them, which we've given to Optimum, uh, is really a, a really a big, big help. Next slide. Jocelyn, can you get to the, 
You're in control, right? Yeah, oh, mine, mine shows the next slide. Are you not seeing the next slide? No, we're still on the first page here. Now, do you see it? There okay. we go. So what I'm doing with this information, I've done most of it already, is I'm trying to build out cost models and sort of business models around three business models. One is uh, municipal utility, which the municipality owns everything and manages everything almost always with subcontractors doing the work. This is the model that's in use in well over 20 towns now in Western Massachusetts is operating very well. I have yet to talk to a town up there that isn't extremely happy with what they're doing. Um, the second would be a, a model that's been used in some places in the country where the municipality owns the wire and a private carrier does the services and electronics. This is the model that we had proposed for Norfolk and other places. And three is a, a model that is not in common use for obvious reasons, but one that's being explored now between ourselves and Frontier, which is that basically the a, a private carrier gets money from the public agency uh, and does what it will with it to, to fill out a network that wouldn't be possible otherwise. Um, that's sort of like what's happening in rural air America now where federal subsidies go to carriers, um, util electric utilities, telephone companies, and they just give the money to them and the carrier does the rest. This is a little more specific with Frontier and that uh, the idea would be that we would basically pay for the trunk wiring but they would own it and manage it. It's a lot less expensive than if we did it independently. I'm gonna be able to put that together for every town in the region. Uh, we've had the cost validated not only with Torrington and ourselves, but I've been able to compare it to the actual costs of networks in Western Massachusetts, which are of the same size, ranging from say 850 homes to 3000 homes. So I'm very comfortable now, we've got numbers that are realizable and believable and you know within plus or minus 10 or 15 percent of what it would likely happen when you actually get down to doing the work. Next slide. This is the first thing this is the first part of it. Um, it's, it's obviously and I'm not going to go into it but this is an example of for every town in Litchfield County um, I built out a system where I can show you what it's going to cost to do the trunk wiring. Um, Assuming all it's aerial, I know of three places where it isn't all aerial, so I have a separate column for undergrounding. And the complication is in the in the costing for aerial because I've been able to use the two data points we have in West in, in Norfolk and um, Torrington. Torrington is about seventy five thousand dollars a mile, and Norfolk's about fifty two thousand dollars a mile. So they're really quite different depending upon the density of housing on the road. Uh, so I've been able to use that to be a more refined picture for every town. Um, then I've got a, go ahead. I was just going to throw in, we know you can't read this and we are going to follow up with an email with all. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is all coming out on an email with a package on the business models and, and explanations for everything. Uh, and then there'll be three then more pages. One will go through a, a business model of utility, a business model of owning the wire and a business model of handing money to a frontier. Uh, based upon various take rates. So you'll be able to pretty much see what it would look like under any conceivable plan. And I should have this finished by the in the next week. And then we'll send it to everybody. Um, in addition to that, um, <laughs> I think Jocelyn probably sent this out earlier, but we're trying to think of ways of spending ARPA money usefully in broadband. Um, it, that's a tricky business because the, um, it's a tricky business and all of you know why. It's, it's hard to figure out how you manage the money when you've got to take account of people's incomes and you, know, you don't want to be giving money to people who could afford to do it themselves. On the other hand, it would be really good to have some of these gaps that we have uh, settled out in networks that we existing have, have existing now. now. I've been tracking the federal infrastructure bill very closely. I've read them all, um, I've got views of them. Uh, they aren't particularly happy views for our region, but if the bill that is currently floating in the House doesn't change the Senate bill, Connecticut will get $100 million. Um, if Connecticut is willing to spend that money on areas that aren't going to be fiberized naturally in the next five years, that would open up an opportunity, and I think that's the way they would have to do it, uh, that would open up an opportunity for some of that money, maybe a significant amount of that money to flow to the Northwest corner, because we're not going to be fiberized outside of Optimum towns. 
uh, by anybody without subsidies. I'm meeting with Maria Horn tomorrow morning and we're gonna start plotting how to do this uh, when, the, when the bill comes up. This won't happen of course until late next spring at the earliest, but the bill should pass in October, maybe November, it takes 180 days to get it put together. So grant applications will be floating around in the May or June timeframe. Uh, I'm refashioning the Northwest Connect website significantly. It's gonna be a much better website. It's largely intended to support the 11 or 12 local committees and hopefully we will have committees in the other 10 or 15 towns of the region over time. Uh, we're trying to organize a common approach to Optimum for Optimum towns, the eight towns that are using Optimum here. And that has moved slowly because Optimum has stopped returning my phone calls. Um, but if we can connect with them again, we were gonna to try to get them to make a better network. Working very closely with Norfolk, uh, obviously the committee here and uh, we're having some meetings in the next week or two to try to, to move the Norfolk um, network into reality um, with a different kind of business model than the one we proposed last spring. A little cheaper, a lot cheaper actually. I've been working on Montouch Make Ready with the Pura. Uh, we are now an official participant, which has the advantage of knowing what's going on and participating, but has disadvantage that we have to actually do it. And it's a, it's a cumbersome, strange process, uh, but very interesting actually. But I think one touch maker is gonna happen. I think it's gonna actually materialize this, this year. But we are talking seriously to Frontier um, and by seriously, I mean we've exchanged N NDAs and we have a cost proposal from them. It's very attractive. Um, now it's, it's Frontier and it's a phone company and working out all the details is not gonna be simple. Uh, but Frontier needs to do it. Frontier wants to do it. We need to do it. We want to do it. Um, you know, if we can get the I's dotted and T's crossed over the next few months, um, we might have a model for the other towns in the region that will be much less expensive and much more attractive than doing it yourself. And finally, as Jocelyn mentioned, um, we're working on the Build Back Better program. There's a component of broadband in it, but it's mostly agriculture, at least the one I'm working on. And as I said earlier, I have provided a two-page document to Jocelyn, single-spaced, but it covers everything. <laughs> and I want cheers for that, please. <laughs> hey. If it was double-spaced, we'd cheer louder, though. <clears throat> no, 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 single-spaced. Okay. Oh, I didn't say, it's two-point type. <laughs> now, Kim, we appreciate all your efforts on this. Hey, Don, I just have one comment for Kim for Goshen, if I could. Of course. Um, Kim, you, you have Goshen as all overhead. 40% of our population is underground over to Woodridge Lake. Um, so I don't know how you. I didn't, uh, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know uh, what, I'm, what I'm hoping is when I send this thing out, you will get a, the spreadsheet itself, not just the pictures of it. Okay. And you will be able to put in your own numbers. If you know it's 40% underground, you put 40% in, you just go into little your, your little cubicle. It'll change the number and it changes everything else. Okay, good, great, thank you. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I know I know what undergrounding is in in, in, in uh, Torrington. I know what undergrounding is in in Bark Hampstead. I know what it is in Norfolk. Um, other than that, I don't know. If you know, um, put it in, and it'll just change everything. I will check ours. I your number for Bark Hampstead looks low, but maybe you actually did the measurement. That no, somebody told me ten percent. Uh, I'll, I'll double check that. It just sounded low to me, but I'll look. Anyway, the, the, the point is to give you a tool that you can easily modify yep. based upon what you learn as you go through things that will give you an up-to-date, more accurate picture of what the costs are going to be. And I explain all the assumptions in the, in the text that comes along with it. All right. All right. Um, we have... Yeah, I can... Here. Jocelyn, you want to go back to that? Yeah, I'm going to just open up the um, memo that was in the agenda packet that hopefully you saw around consultant selection for broadband outreach. We know um, many of your towns do have local committees thinking about broadband, either that's their what they do and or they're an economic development group thinking about this for your town. Um, again, we want to provide uh, someone who can help give them access to the information that they need that we have collected over the years that Kim has put together um, when they need it. And so to do that, we have budgeted as part of our um, partnership planning funding that we've got from EBA again this year, 
a broadband outreach coordination coordination position. Um, formerly, we uh, had been contracting with Ben Poletsky for that, and he has moved on to other work. So we are filling that position. We did a request for qualifications and um, are uh, asking for authorization from the COG board to enter into a contract with Catherine Kiefer to be our broadband outreach consultant uh, for the coming fiscal year. And that was coordinated with Northwest Connect and the Economic Development Corporation. Exactly. So is there a motion to approve that contract or that? No moved. Is there a second? Second. Do we know who that is? Did that was Jim. Okay. Yeah, great. All right. Thanks, Janelle. You know. Yeah, thank you. So Don, the executive committee has reviewed all the other potential consultants and this is the recommendation? Yes. All right, thank you. Uh, and while people are voting, again, I'll just put in another plug for the Economic Development Summit. Um, if you are going to attend, please, uh, please go to the Eventbrite registration page and just let me know. Um, and uh, again, if you wanna share that summit information with your economic development committee or you know, residents in your town that are uh, working on economic development projects or small business support, please feel free to forward that invitation. Thanks, Jocelyn. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, about what we just voted on and how do we access this person for our own personal use and um, if Kim is still on and Jocelyn, you did give us some information about the use of the ARPA money and specifically for broadband. I mean, we're trying to come up with a dollar figure and um, having a hard time finding that to just connect our senior center to our school, which is right across the street. Who, who do you recommend that I can at least just get a dollar figure from? I'm not getting any headway from anyone. Barbara, if I could interject there, we had the same situation with our town hall. And we reached out to CEN. We basically installed our own cable underground through a conduit. So we own the cable. Don't go to somebody who's gonna string it on a telephone pole. And it's a pretty straightforward operation. Talk to CEN, the Connecticut Education Network, because they should, your school should have, you know- the, Do, they, and I think that's who we've been calling. I've, I've put somebody here on the town hall on it and they just are not connected. Barbara? Do you have a name? Barbara? I'm having lunch with the CEN director in an hour. I'll ask him to call you. Great, thank you. But make sure you don't contract with somebody to run the cable, run your own cable. Okay. Because then you own it and there's no maintenance fees, there's no lease fees. And you know, we just ran a conduit underground between the two buildings and it worked out perfectly. Well, we already did that from the firehouse to the town hall, but this does cross a road and it's at an angle, but I'm, I'm sure we could do it. Especially if you can use ARPA money for it. Correct. And that's what I'm trying to do. So, but I, you know, we're just trying to put numbers to all of our categories that we want to get moving on. Or that's show. one of the things I'm going to be talking to, to uh, Ryan about um, is, is how can we can actually instrument the use of the CEN network for things that aren't, aren't just schools. They do this all the time, by the way. They're very happy to connect anybody. Okay. That would be great if you or he or whomever wants to contact me, I'd really appreciate it. All right, which segues right into our next uh, item. A discussion on whether the members would think the COG should have somebody available, a consultant or the like for helping the towns with ARPA funding. Well, and I'll just note, um... I did send out yesterday at that last uh, meeting that we held just to share information between towns about uh, how they're thinking about using ARPA money. Um, we did ask whether uh, you all would be interested in us sort of collecting ARPA proposals from entities that serve multiple towns. So you should have received in your inbox yesterday, um, basically um, a package of ARPA proposals there's one from the Arts Council, from the Transit District. There's one about broadband ideas from Kim and Northwest Connect. 
There's one from Greenwoods Counseling about how you could potentially spend some uh, of your funding on assisting with substance abuse recovery. Um, and then there's one about affordable housing. Um, if we get others from other entities that serve multiple towns, again, we're happy to sort of package them up and, and send them along to you. Um, but I did wanna just mention that that went out yesterday. Yeah, that was nice. Thank you for doing that. That's how I found uh, the information here on the Connect. I mean, we, we've been working on it, but this made it come to the forefront again. Great. So what do the members think about the idea of having a consultant on call on staff? We hadn't talked about how to fund this, but I know that CCM, Mike Musinski has done an awesome job of providing assistance. Um, yes. Don, Don, I do see Jim's hand. You do see a hand up, okay. Yeah. yeah Don, um, you know, when I, that concept first was brought up, it, it seemed very appealing, but the further we got into Treasury's guidance, which is broad, but more importantly, seemed to be very subjective. My thinking was we'd be better off going to our own town attorney to vet these uh, proposals. Rather, I didn't think it would even be possible to find one individual that could incorporate all the nuances of the, of the different municipalities. Good to other, other folks? Yeah, I... And see, I, I came away with the opposite. When I first heard it, I said, we're not going to need that. And um, but, you know, the more you get into it, um, I don't want to be going to the attorney. I, I think because they're starting from the ground, researching all of this, it's going to cost a lot of money. If you had somebody that uh, Mike has been a tremendous resource, but it certainly would not um, hurt to have a go to person in addition to him for this. I mean, you know why? And, and me, I'm being selfish. I got one foot out the door and I feel like I'm just leaving this as I'm going. And, um, you know, all the help we can leave behind might be beneficial, but obviously I'm but a lame duck you, boat. I'm, I'm, moving, <laughs> I'm moving very slowly on this. We have basically four years to spend the money and I'm being very cautious. You know, we have a committee put together to vet ideas, brainstorm ideas. And I don't have a firm date to start spending the money until we've gone through every brainstorm idea and sort of prioritize them. So having some, some kind of consultancy, I don't know whether we need somebody on staff or just between Janelle and Jocelyn and Rob, they come up with a name of somebody that we can go to. But Mike, Mike has been a great resource, I agree. It, other, it, other thoughts? Don, I would say it would be, it really be determined by how complicated it becomes. So ARPA, through the, the federal registry is pretty clear. They give you examples. As long as you stay within those examples, there's safe harbor provisions to be able to do that. Once you start getting creative and using language which says um, municipalities have broad latitude to use these funds provided that they have some relationship to COVID, then you probably need a little bit more direction. Um, so as most of you probably know, we've decided what we're gonna use ARPA funds for um, it's within the guidance and not overly complicated. So I don't think that we would need it. But if, if, if you're trying to dice it out in a lot of different places, which may be questionable whether or not you can or cannot, I mean, I think one municipality was talking about sidewalks, um, then you probably need somebody to give you some guidance so that you don't get a clawback from Fed. Don, you put you put the uh, item on the agenda. I'm not opposed to considering consultancy fees. The question is, A, where does the money come from? Can we use the ARPA money itself for that purpose? You know, pro rata, would we do it hourly, town by town for people that want access or don't want access? Uh, you know, we're talking about a lot of money. And, and like you say, there's really not a, you know, a huge need to to jump in and start writing checks right this second because the the legislation allows us some time. You know, I just I'd like to know how we're planning to on funding the consultancy that as it's put on the agenda now, or or can we use the ARPA funding itself? To well, kind my of thought right? is not that it would be a cog staff member necessarily, but maybe someone available. So if you want consultancy and you get the hours from that individual, you pay for it, whether it's out of town funds or ARPA funds, that, you know, that's to be determined. But I don't think it was that we would have an ARPA staff member on the COG team that is being paid by the COG. 
at a cog budget. It would be a town by town. Well, it's not clear what's, town, you know. why it's on the agenda if there's not a proposal for us to consider, or are we just kind of doing a feeler thing? This is just, this was mentioned at the, you know, phone call we had a week or so ago as a possibility. So it's on the agenda just for consideration. And if there's no interest, it won't be on the agenda. If there's interest, you know, the staff can do a little homework on who might be a good good resource. But it was not a proposal to hire somebody per se. Yeah, I wouldn't be in favor of that. Having a new uh, paid staff. Yeah, I, I'm not looking for staff either. If it were to go that route, I'd like it to, to see it be town by town individuals, you know, whether it's you know hourly legal review or or consult you know some individual consultancy so if we had questions or concerns the towns could reach out and and you know use the same person like you say that we're setting up a person who has knowledge like mike uh so that they're not you know starting from ground zero every time we reached out yeah so well, unless yeah, they, just... they, could, they could be set up a lot like the uh, engineer that we had under, you know, to serve whichever towns were interested in utilizing it. Um, but we did the RFP, we made sure they had the experience. Um, this would be like some, you know, someone who has the legal background and understands all of the ARPA. Uh, and with a fixed experience. hourly rate. Correct. Yeah, negotiated in, in advance, and then any town that wants to take advantage of it could. But just throwing that out there, right. just yeah. another example but of what we have done. Then we could kind of share information in between the towns that, you know, uh, different individual towns are considering this type of use. It's been vetted through the consultant. So if you have a, a parallel path you want to follow, this doesn't seem to be controversial, and it's already been screened. You know, so that, you know, we go to school on each other here if there's, you know, some synergy we can create. But I like that idea. Anyone else? Rob, why don't you or Jocelyn take a look if there's somebody out there with the qualifications that, you know, if we wanted to do an RFP or whether there's someone that we could, that the COG could offer up as a consultant with a fixed hourly rate based on a town's interest or needs. All right, um, we're down to the second page. We're still ahead of schedule. This is a miracle. Hey, Don. Um, yes. I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I have to leave. I'm uh, got, got to get on a board of directors meeting, but um, I just wanted to throw something out when you go around for the town. I you know, concerns. And I just wanted, I would like to know if anybody's looking at these act concerning recommendations by the Department of Motor, motor Vehicles to, you know, impose by ordinance fines for uh, owners of motor vehicles that are subject to local property tax, but they're not registered here. I just want to plant that seed. And um, if you don't get to it today, I'll send an email out. I'd like to know if anybody's considering doing something about that. I'm sorry. And thank you. <laughs> if you could send an email, that'd be good, Barbara. Okay. All right. We're, we're gonna miss you too when you don't run again. <laughs> Two more months, almost to the day. <laughs> Me and Bob. <laughs> okay. Bye -bye. Well, we're not gonna miss Bob. We're gonna miss you. <laughs> um, minutes for the July eighth regular meeting and the August twelfth special meeting is a motion to approve. Um, Chairman, I do want to bring up one thing. Craig Nelson did call me. There is a slight amendment that he had to the minutes regarding the fact that the dial a ride program is not new. So I can go ahead and make that change. You know, that should be part of the motion. Mm -hmm. The minutes has corrected. Yeah. So is, is there a motion on those two sets of minutes? So moved. And that's with the correction that Jocelyn made. The correction as stated. Is there a second? I see Charlie. Charlie raised his hands, okay. Mm -hmm. Any other corrections or changes? Not All right, we should go ahead and vote. I can launch a poll. All right, well, let's, okay, leave that up for a minute. So we need a motion on the uh, financial statement or the statements for June and July. So moved. Is there a second? 
Any I'll second it. All right. Any corrections or additions to that? I did have one question if Darlene is on. I see that we're for the last fiscal year, we're still about a hundred thousand dollars short on revenue. Is that going to remain that way? Or do we see that revenue coming in? She's listened to your question. Yeah. We do have some grants that we're not going to be getting all the funding for. Um, so I think some of them were kind of overestimated. Uh, so I'm, I have to look more closely at what the other ones are, but we're not going to collect it all. All right, but we, we still had a decent surplus for the last year. Yes, like. we do. Yep, we do. All right. Uh, the next item then is uh, the amendment to the policies regarding uh, employee benefits vacation with pay. And that was a executive committee recommendation to approve that. Is there a uh, motion to approve? So moved. And we moved it. Is there a second? I see Tom. Charlie, any questions or discussion on that one? Okay, then there's an MOU for the COG collaboration. Is there a motion on that one? So moved. Uh, Bob, second. I see Maggie. Okay, any, any questions or comments on that one? Okay, and then the last one is a regional service grant resolution. What is... Is there a motion to approve that one? I see Matt. Okay, is there a second? Charlie. So on any one of these five, are there any questions, comments that have not been raised yet? All right. Uh, that was quick. People were voting while I was talking. Okay. So that brings us down 25 minutes early to town by town issues. Should we just go in alphabetical order? Sure. Um, do you want to start? With sure. Um, the only thing I'll bring up is we had, thanks to Jocelyn and David Berto, I think a, I'll call it a very successful housing meeting last night. We're in the midst of our housing plan as are several other towns in the region. So this was the final community forum. Uh, we made it into an ice cream social, which people always like. But in any case, we had close to 40 people there. Um, it was very hard for the people in the audience to distinguish between the housing plan and the proposed housing development by the Park Hampstead Housing Trust, which is 20 to 30 units on a very large farm on the west end of town. And we kept having to steer them back to the plan and then they kept going back to the housing. But it was, uh, by my standards, a very benign meeting. People asked reasonable questions. There was a lack of understanding of affordable housing versus low income or, you know, Section 8 housing. But on the whole, I think we uh, checked the box well. I think Jocelyn did a good job supporting us. We had David Berto there just in case. I stumbled, which I did a few times on definitions of the types of housing and the qualifications. But on the whole, I think it went very well. Jocelyn, what was your thoughts on last night? Uh, yeah, no, I think it went. I think it went well. And again, it's just uh, you know going through that process of doing the creating the housing plan and getting community feedback and getting everyone up to speed. You know, residents that don't think about affordable housing every day on kind of what we mean when we're talking about it and um, what the actions might be that that towns and nonprofits can take to address the housing needs. So yeah, I think it went well. And you know, the average age of the people in the audience, as you can imagine, were the senior citizens who are most interested in finding some seniors housing in the town, which doesn't exist at the moment. So in any case, I'm glad to get through that milestone. I thought it was a good, good event. Burlington. Okay. Um, uh, new to uh, to talk about is uh, the town of Burlington has uh, 
purchased and acquired and put together seven acres uh, in which the town owns and can manage um, uh, for, we're, we're seeking um, developers and construction folks uh, for some multi-purpose development in the center of town. This has been in the works for quite some time. So we're, you know, we're very happy that we've gotten to the stage. So far, uh, we've just had folks just looking at the property. So um, maybe there's more to report later on. We haven't done anything formal in terms of bidding this out, putting out bids, you know, requests for bids and all that. But we're just, uh, folks are just taking a look at it now that are, um, that could possibly develop this. So that's exciting. And then um, our Tavern Day is this weekend. Again, taking a lot of thought on having an out, a big, large outdoor fair. So we're putting in some guidelines. And uh, so the, that's coming up, uh, not this weekend, but the weekend after. That's called Tavern Day. And we do have a, a large beer garden that goes along with that for anybody that's interested. And then, um, and then this evening, our planning and zoning is having a, a public hearing on uh, a possible moratorium on the cannabis uh, new legislation. Uh, would be a one-year moratorium. So just thought I'd throw that out for the other communities in case you guys were considering that, but that's kind of where we fell on. I'm sorry. Okay, so um, that's all that uh, that's happening in Burlington. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Canaan Falls Village, Henry? Uh, nothing much happening in our town uh, other than the fact that we've opened a brand new restaurant in town, which has been very well received, uh, and a new uh, uh, gallery in town that started out. Uh, and we're trying to uh, edge through the uh, final public hearings on uh, our, uh, our housing plan. And um, we're having the same problem uh, that everybody else has the disconnect between affordable housing and the affordable housing plan. But other than that, life goes on. Great, thanks. Colebrook? We may have had some drop off. Um, Cornwall. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Yeah, we're fine here. Uh, we are concerned about the increase in COVID cases in town. We have a visitor to town hall test positive this week. So we are uh, going back to by appointment only. Uh, next week, uh, we have our ag fair coming up to where asking people to wear masks and hopefully have all our events outside. Um, and again, have some very positive uh, developments in town. But anyway, wish everybody well. Thanks. And, John, and uh, we are working on our housing plan. Janelle's doing a great job for us, and we set a uh, form for that on October 20th. Uh, a lot of good input on that again, and, and thanks uh, for her efforts, and uh, and we're getting, getting some good work on that. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Goshen? Uh, Goshen, um, I just want to say this past weekend, we had a successful Goshen Fair. It was nice to to have that happen once again, uh, very well attended, a little rainy on Sunday, but all in all, uh, went off well. Um, again, it's good to see that happen again. Uh, ARPA funds, as I had mentioned before, uh, I've already gotten buy-in from the Board of Finance, <clears throat> excuse me, Board of Selectmen, our accounting consultants, uh, King and King, uh, on use of ARPA funds. We are planning on going to town meeting on the allocation of the entire amount on October 25th. And we hope to just get that taken care of, even though we do have a long time to do it. Uh, just something I wanna finish up before I leave. Housing plan, uh, Jocelyn's been extremely helpful with our housing plan. We have had two informational meetings. Uh, the first informational meeting, I think we had 115 people log in and attend in person or digitally. Uh, the second plan, it was down to about 40 people. I'd like to think that we were uh, successful in educating people somewhat, although as all of you know, there's some people who 
maybe just don't want to hear things and have an opinion and think that maybe we're pulling the wool over their eyes. I don't think we can change those opinions. Uh, we intend to have our housing plan completed by October um, and move forward. So that's Great. it. Heartland, Maggie? Well, good morning. No news is good news in Heartland. It's quiet for a change. I'm enjoying that. Um, nothing really to report. Wish you all well. Harwinston, Mike. Mike, are you there? Next up, Ken, Jean. Good morning, everybody. Life moves along. Um, we're waiting to hear back on our grant application for our affordable housing plan. Um, we're hopefully going to have our first broadband committee meeting in the next week and a half. We have to get it approved by the Board of Selectmen and get a charge. And Kim, if you have any time today, I'd love to just have a quick chat with you about um, some broadband stuff, getting ready for the Board of Selectmen meeting. Um, we're, we had a meeting yesterday for our ARPA committee. We're working on a, putting a needs assessment survey out to the public via Survey, Mon survey Monkey, and that's going on really well, we're making good progress. Um, we have a 9-11 ceremony Saturday morning. Um, just, you know, lots of plates spinning in the air. Great, thanks, Jean. Litchfield, Denise? Thank you. Um, in Litchfield, um, we have been meeting about once a month for our ARPA money ideas. Um, we, like uh, Bar Camp said, are not in a rush. Um, we are being thoughtful in the process. We've received a lot of uh, requests from our nonprofits, and we're starting to hear from small businesses that have been affected in town. Um, so we're putting together a formal, more formal process so that they can apply to the um, town to have a vetting process for that. As far as the affordable housing um, plan, we did receive the grant um, information that we did receive the grant last week. So I'm working on putting together that steering committee. Um, we also last week, I uh, met with uh, the attorneys from the four towns of Wilmogo and Litchfield about the consolidation plans and the timeline that we're gonna be following going forward. So we're just trying to um, tighten that up so that we can all move in the same direction <coughs> towards a possible consolidation to district 20. Um, this Saturday, uh, the town did is having a 9-11 um, 20th anniversary memorial at the American Legion, and we're also going to be honoring our local uh, first responders, our police officers, and our CERT team, which was um, very active during COVID. Our planning and zoning did approve a cannabis moratorium um, for one year. And then as far as um, Barbara had asked about the ordinance for motor vehicles that Waterbury is doing, I have had somebody that has uh, reached out to the town and wanting us to look into that. We talked about it at the last board of selectmen meeting. I have um, in the last few months met with our tax assessor who did send out letters to all the residents in town that do not have a motor vehicle registered um, with that residence. So she's uh, going through and finding out if maybe the house is a, a vacation home or is a uh, rental rented home or if their residence um, here is uh, not full time, they're, they're Florida residents of who were previously Litchfield residents. So we're still working through that process. And I don't think we have really that many people that uh, fall into the category. Um, it could be 50 houses maybe. So we're still looking into that. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Morris, Tom. Uh, yeah, we had a vaccine clinic here at Town Hall on August 27th. We're going to have a follow-up one September 17th from 9 to 6. Went very well. Griffin Hospital does it. They are wonderful to work with. Uh, our housing plan is almost done. A uh, couple more hoops to go through. Thanks in a large part to Jocelyn for all of her hard work. 
Uh, we were notified by FEMA. We're going to be receiving some storm damage funds from the tropical storm a year ago, August. It almost makes it worthwhile going through the process. It was quite painful. And we're actually going to have a question on the ballot this November about the sale of cannabis in the town of Morris. Uh, a petition went out. They got the required signatures, so it will be on the ballot in Morris. Uh, and we also ran our ARPA revenue replacement calculator for the town, and it shows that the feds owe the town of Morris and are $350,000, but I don't think we'll be seeing that. And I don't, as far as the funds go, I don't think we'll be using any of the money to uh, replace the revenue for the town of Morris. That's it. Um, great. New Hartford, Dan? Has he left us? He's off. Yeah, I think he signed off. Um, Norfolk, Matt? Yeah, um, we are. We formed a committee for the uh, ARPA money. Um, we did that through the board of uh, our board of finance. Uh, we do have our housing uh, affordable housing plan forum on Monday, uh, the twenty seventh of September. Thanks to Jocelyn for all of her hard work. Um, we were approved to put in a solar field at our transfer station by Eversource, so we're work moving forward forward with that. Um, and we also have a, another big project is a, we have, we have um, solicited a uh, architect, architectural firm for a new firehouse. So other than all the road projects that are going on, we're quite busy. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, North Canaan, Charlie. Uh, yes, we're going to have a uh... Griffin Clinic uh, this Saturday from 10 to 4, open to all Northwest Corner residents uh, for COVID shots. They're coming with all three uh, uh, vaccines, and plus they're going to get the one for the immune people that can get their first shot on that one too, a booster shot. So that's kind of going to be happening in the town. Um, our road project in the center of town is still a mess, <laughs> and I think it's going to be a mess for a while. We just got an email today that uh, railroad is not going to be doing anything in the center of town until at least mid-October, so it's bear with it when you come to town through the town of North Canaan. It's a disaster driving through it. Uh, we have a bridge replacement on Toby Hill that was supposed to end in the middle of November, but with the two high floods, uh, it's been pushed now until almost the middle of December. Um, they've been trying to pour concrete and the river has been unbelievable high coming from the dam on the Massachusetts side. It's been, they got their work out for them. Also, I'd like to thank Joshlin. We got our uh, um, money that we applied for, for grant money for our housing project or a plan that we're going to start forward to get that moving now. Um, and also, we started a committee. Uh, we just appointed them uh, Tuesday night at our selections meeting to start our uh, APR fund, uh, consult, you know, to work on that plan. Uh, again, we're not in a big rush to spend that money, so we got some time to uh, put a lot of ideas together. We're getting some emails of people interested in applying for it and all that. So, and the biggest thing that's been going on is we've had an influx of a lot of homeless people in town, North Canaan. We've gone from four to six and uh, it just been crazy. We have, we put outreach to them, our social worker, our resident trooper has been talking to them. We got them, a couple of them on waiting list and some don't want any help at all. So it's a tough decision and getting a lot of, you know, from residents in town, what we're gonna be doing, but we're doing our best. We got a couple of them in a couple of abandoned houses that we found out there was some living in them and we kind of boarded those up and it's, it's a tough situation on those. Uh, and unfortunately, two of them are local people that uh, do have family in town, and they kind of turned their back on them, which is very sad. So we're doing our best to accommodate them, and they're living out on our underneath our pavilion and sitting on the benches there. And it's actually a, not a good site, but we do have them on a waiting list, and it's like a mile long, the difference housing. So that's our big stuff going on in North Canaan. Thanks, Charlie. Um, Barbara's left us. Curtis Salisbury. Uh, we're good. Um, the only, um, I have a question maybe for 
some of the cog or, or any of you, we're trying to do our POCD, which is 2022. Um, we're running into trouble finding a consultant who will be able to do it in a timely way. Has anyone worked with uh, OPM to get an extension on a POCD? I, I, see, I see Maggie right, right. in that. Yeah, Rob Phillips. When when I worked uh, locally uh, in Southington, when I came in, when I came on to that job, uh, quickly realized that they were running up against uh, a deadline, uh, and they weren't they they didn't start their process. So uh, basically, you can you can uh, <clears throat> contact OPM and uh, and Dan Morley and, and and request an extension, and they'll they'll you know, I haven't seen anybody not grant an extension. That's who to contact is Dan Morley. Uh, that's who I, yeah, I believe so. That's who I had contact with. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. Otherwise, everything's pretty good in Salzburg. Curtis, the other thing we did, and it worked out fairly well, is we yeah. reached out to UConn to get a graduate student yep. as a project. Yep. And that worked out for us. We did that for one of our POCDs. And it's okay. a fairly nominal cost. And, you know, you're getting somebody who's a little bit novice at it, but it's, it makes a difference in terms of getting the work done. Yeah. That's good, thanks. We're about to appoint a uh, conservation commission. We split the old conservation, we renamed it Inland Wetlands. So we're gonna have both. Um, we're appointing a committee for designing um, a fairly large number of affordable housing units on the Pope property, which the town bought a couple of years ago. And um, so we're just working on all that. I think that's about it. Um, Thank you for your vote on the on the uh, Black Forest um, application. So have a good month, everybody. Thanks, Thanks Curtis. Curtis. Um, Sharon, Bren, has he left? Um, Torrington, Mayor Carbone. I think she's left. Warren? Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, just a couple of quick things. We uh, we are not having a fall festival. The Warren the fire company typically does a, a festival, and it's actually interesting that um, people are commenting now on social media in town that uh, they actually do care about the festival and that it, being a fire company fundraiser, people realize the value in it. But it also is one of our the few community events that we have in our little town. So it's nice to hear people uh, expressing. Um, interest in the festival even though this year we haven't been able to do it because of the um, a lot of our uh, older folks who help out with different things aren't interested in um, being vulnerable in a community setting but uh, I thought that was nice to hear the public uh, commenting in a positive way about it um, looking forward to wrapping up our plan in the next couple of months with Jocelyn in the housing it's been an interesting uh, process and we too I think struggled a little bit with the separation of the housing corporation and the in the plan but it's a learning experience for everyone and uh, we're looking to um, gain momentum with the plan to hopefully bring uh, our, our uh, housing uh, the plan that we have for some housing to fruition even though it still looks like a, a one to three year window out so um, that's what's up with that and uh, we have a committee that we started uh, with a uh, farm property that we bought 10 years ago. Uh, a, we put together a committee uh, to, to uh, reach out to the community and make a, make a uh, summary to report back to the town, uh, the Board of Selectmen, and uh, to report to the town. And um, somehow it en ended up uh, uh, surprisingly get, it, uh, got a little bit political, um, <laughs> uh, which is not a big surprise, but uh, we're looking forward to wrapping that up and getting some kind of a, um, a report out to the community. That's about a hundred acre property, uh, mostly farmland, uh, a little bit of wetlands, uh, but that's been an interesting interesting year long committee. Uh, so that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Washington, Jim. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, so we're we're pretty busy. Our public works uh, took on an aggressive road schedule this year and, and the storms really didn't help a whole lot, uh, but they've been doing a great job. A lot of the projects are being done in-house, uh, some major drainage and repair work. That's been keeping them busy. Put us a little bit behind. Uh, bridge work, same thing, a little bit behind. Still continuing to discuss uh, ARPA uses. Um, a lot of feedback from our not-for-profits, not so much from our business community, uh, 
but more our, our nonprofits. Uh, this Saturday, we, we are doing a, a larger than normal 9-11 uh, service with uh, Fife and Drum Corps, uh, more speakers in attendance, relatives of victims uh, to recognize them. We've also done a proclamation for our fire, EMS, and police. Um, and that's about it. Uh, other than that, uh, we, we continue to push people a little bit on vaccines. Um, uh, Tim did some outreach uh, with the clinics being held in Warren. So we put that out to our community members. Uh, we had uh, one in Roxbury that was open to our community members. We're, we're just kind of stuck at that 71, 72% uh, overall of eligible ages. So that's a little bit frustrating. We're, we're, we're trying to work through that. Other than that, I uh, hope everyone has a great month. Thank you. And um, last but not least, Winchester, Josh. Of course, thank you so much. Um, so things have been moving along pretty well here uh, since I started and over the past month, uh, we did receive notification uh, and very much thanks to the help of Jocelyn that we will be receiving the affordable housing, uh, an affordable housing planning grant uh, from the states in the amount of just over $14,000. Um, so we'll begin working on that in the very near future. Uh, we've seen a number of new businesses move in on Main Street um, I personally remain concerned about COVID. Winchester's numbers aren't really that far from the norm, um, but we do have a lot of businesses where folks are congregating. And um, I've talked with Mayor Carbone about the possibility of at least sending out a notice to businesses saying that we encourage, if not require, um, you know, masks to be worn. We want to make sure that people know that that is something that uh, we look favorably on in any case. So uh, no action has been taken on that at this point, but uh, it's something that we're both considering. Um, we are currently evaluating an infrastructure bond here in Winchester, and it was recently announced that our director of finance, Bruce Stratford, will be retiring as of December 31st. So uh, we will be posting for that soon, if any of you know uh, somebody who would make a great fit for a director of finance position. Um, the Winstead Firemen's Carnival this uh, just a couple weeks ago was a huge success. Thank you to all of you who had your fire departments or companies participate in the parade. Um, that was held uh, just a couple Saturdays ago. Um, and with the ARPA committee that we've put together, um, we're actually, we believe we have a pretty set lineup of at least what we're going to use the first tranche of money for. So we'll be discussing that next week. Uh, and that might move forward for consideration by our board of selectmen as early as um, the first week in October. So if anybody's interested in how we're progressing on that, please feel free to follow up with me privately. Um, but that's really it from us. Uh, thanks. I hope everybody has a great month. All right. It looks like we're uh, ready to adjourn unless anybody has anything else. I'll uh, just, uh, just announce what the next meeting is, uh, uh, sorry, October 14th. And we'll decide about virtual versus in person when we see how the numbers play out over the next few weeks. But I, I will say that when you look at the map, the northwest corner is fair, fairly well compared to the rest of the state so far. So we hope that continues. But thanks, everyone. Have a good, good month. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. You too. Thanks for an efficient meeting, Don, and everybody. <laughs>